Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today I'll be presenting a case of a 73 year old male who presented to ER with alleged history of accidental ingestion of two mouthful of a paracute pesticide, uh, which he mistook for a cold drink. He had, following that, he had three to four episodes of vomiting and uh, had complaints of central chest discomfort and low backache. Uh, this happened on 22nd at around 4 p.m., but the patient uh, went to outside hospital uh, towards night because of persisting chest discomfort and outside uh, they had done uh, uh, NG tube uh, insertion and aspiration was done and uh, they uh, he came here with a gastric aspirate sample. He also gives history of a toady intake before the pesticide ingestion and uh, on arrival your initial assessment he was conscious and oriented obeying commands, airway was patent, no pulling of secretions or gurgling sounds and no secretions. Uh, breathing, uh, there was bilateral basal minimal crepitations are present uh, with air entry bilateral equal, uh, respiratory rate of 26 per minute and a saturation of 96 percentage on room. Circulation patient uh, heart rate was 78 per minute with BP of 150 90 millimeters of mercury. Disability patient uh, GCS was uh, full E4 E5 M6 with the pupils equal reacting to light uh, 2 millimeter and uh, moving all four limbs. Exposure uh, temperature was uh, 98 uh, and uh, GRBS of 110. Adjuncts of primary survey, ECG uh, was taken which showed uh, first degree uh, heart block and uh, ABG was taken which showed a pH of uh, 7.3 with bicarb of 19.3 and uh, PO, PCO2 47, PO2 of 94. Lactate was 2, uh, creatinine was 2.73. Okay. So, uh Age of the patient? From Age of the patient, 73 year old. 73 year old male. Uh, when was the ingestion happened? Happened at 22nd around 4 pm. 4 pm. He came to us? So, uh, he came uh, towards <coughs> night at 12. He went to outside. Same hospital. day? Yeah, same day. Same day, after 22nd, same day, same night. Same day meaning after 12. So after 12. Day. Maybe Early like, like 10 hours, 12 hours later. Yeah, later. 12 hours later, he come. Almost in the 12 hours period, he came, period he, came, for, yeah. he came to us for further management. management. So, on arrival, he is conscious oriented. oriented. Uh, he was taken to an initial hospital where an gastric lavage was done. Yeah. So, 4 p.m. this ingestion happened. Okay. When, what time he did uh, go to the first hospital? First hospital after 12, they said around 3 that day. Around 3 a.m. Yeah, 3 a.m. 3 a.m. because of processing chest discomfort. Okay. So, again, there is no indication for a gastric lavage to be given at that As point of time <laughs> because almost it's more than 8 hours. Okay. Then. Uh, the next thing they, they did lavage and some aspirate, aspirate and aspirate. they sent to us for further management. On arrival, he is conscious oriented, no. airway maintained, maintained except for tachypnea. Uh, comorbidities for him? No comorbidities. No comorbidities. So he is having an uh, at present a PCO2 of uh, 57 or something, 47 you said. PCO2 47. 47, pH 7.3 bicarbonate on the lower side. Lower, so he is having an uh, metabolic acidosis. With the respiratory acidosis also, right? So, uh, because for 19 bicarbonate, our expected PCO2 is not 47. It should be much less than that. So, he is having uh, an uh, metabolic as well as respiratory acidosis and he has come to us for further management. So, what was done for him? Uh, initially, uh, yeah, for first we uh, took the uh, blood samples mm -hmm. and also ordered for ex chest x-ray. Okay. And uh, also... Uh, we have planned uh, further. Initially, he told it was a green black liquid. So, further, we told them to uh, investigate regarding what compound it was. And they took pictures and sent us. We checked the expiry date and which compound it was and confirmed as paracut. Okay. And uh, further uh, management, we uh, uh, like after taking the initial uh, blood samples and <coughs> blood urine, also we sent for toxicology and also uh, the gastric aspirate, also for toxicology. Okay. So and for alcohol intake was also mentioned. mentioned. Also so, first of all, let's start from the beginning when uh, imagine that he has come to us for further management initially itself. So, the patient has come with an unknown ingestion and when will you suspect, okay, this is a probable paraquet poisoning. So, paraquet uh, is not uh, very uncommon to be very frank. Uh, previously and all, we used to say every organophosphorus, it used to be organophosphorus, but now paraquet poisoning, these days the numbers are going up. So, when seeing what all symptoms you can say, this is probably we are dealing with a probable paraquet.
what are the things in the initial presentations initial presentation you have to check uh, we can see after ingestion there can be uh, evidence of any oral burns you have to check okay most commonly seen with paracet poison okay uh, and also we have to uh, check, uh, stabilize uh, so first common history you can ask what the preparation is used for Mm -hmm. used for uh, if it is herbicide herb one is thing it is commonly paracut is used as a herbicide. herbicide that is one thing and what are the symptoms that he developed after the ingestion, ingestion. so the, as you said local yeah. burn and you can have the yeah. classical yeah. paracut tongue paracut tongue is one common thing it is a large swollen tongue you will be because of the direct contact the tongue can be edematous and if the patient is putting out the tongue it can be a large edematous tongue so that is one airway issue that we might anticipate when you are having a patient with uh, paracotoxicity so one, that is one thing oral burns the initial symptoms depends upon the amount of ingestion that he has taken mm -hmm. so you can say less than 20 20 to 40 milligram per kilogram body weight and above 40 milligram per kilogram body weight so if it is something less than 20, 20 milligram per uh, kilogram body weight then usually there can be milder symptoms there will not be any major uh, uh, clinical features the patient might not be having maybe some gi symptoms mm -hmm. Some between 20 to 40 milligram per kg he has consumed, then he developed uh, definitely the GI symptoms. All the GI symptoms, the classical GI symptoms, he will start developing and definitely more than that vomiting, abdominal pain, all those things, oral burns, all those things can be seen. Then coming to the problem with paracut. Problem with paracut, it has got high affinity to the lungs and to the kidney. So uh, you have no, there are two alveolar cells, type 1 and type 2. So this paracut has got which has got this molecule has got a resemblance uh, to the alveolar hemorrhage cells that we need to attract so what will happen is that this have got very much high affinity so the concentration in the lung will be maximum when you look into the blood concentration it will be 20 times or even 10 to 20 times more than it will be more concentrated in the lungs so that is the reason primarily this patient is having respiratory issues so that is one major uh, hit that they will have Usually when you have 20, less than 20 milligram, they don't have major respiratory symptoms. But starting from 40 milligram to more than that, they may go into ARDS sort of a picture and they can have pulmonary fibrosis also. So that are the issues that you need to anticipate. So that is regarding uh, lung management, lung issues. Then it can also start affecting the kidneys also. So he here being an elderly gentleman, 73 year old, Maybe uh, his, he's having some amount of age-related kidney disease, we don't know. And on, that is the reason why you are anticipating a sudden renal injury of 2.7 creatine. That's what you said. Because within 24 hours, his creatine has gone up to 2.4. So, uh, 2.7, whatever weight. So, this free radical injury. So, that is the free radical injury that is happening because of the toxins what are being generated from the paraquet is the major culprit and these are the two organs that is very commonly involved. So what you need to understand somebody is coming with an unknown ingestion and they are developing a sudden onset of respiratory uh, issues. Uh, it can be similar, you can have pneumonitis also. If, even if you think it's an acid ingestion, they can have chemical pneumonitis. But along with that a renal dysfunction also. So when you have both this combination together, one thing that you need to suspect is paraquet. So that is how you have to have a clinical suspicion. Here you got the paraquet bottle. So it is very easy. You confirm that it is paraquet now. So now the patient has, imagine that the patient has presented to the ED. Starting from decontamination, how, what are the uh, management aspects that you need to think of paraquet? You have sent for your toxicology lab. Uh, most importantly, what is the investigation you need to send is urine paraquet level. That is a one most important investigation. Depending upon the urine paraquet level, we can predict the outcome of the patient if it is very high like more than 2 milligram per ml uh, you in no more than 2 milligram per milliculins or something more than 2 milligram present in the urine uh, it has got very uh, bad mortality so uh, that is what uh, you need to understand so we have sent for evaluation and also as you said he has al consumed alcohol also alcohol. so also you need to think of co-ingestion so you can have alcohol related problems also maybe it's a toxic alcohol that might be also the reason for the renal dysfunction. We don't know whether the toxic alcohol ingestion can cause the renal dysfunction also. So we need to identify what are the exact problems. So when you really suspect, okay, this is due to toxic alcohol ingestion, the same patient, the same patient has come to you, you are thinking in terms of paracrit overdose and you suspect you are seeing metabolic acidosis as well as respiratory acidosis. So I am telling that this is due to by seeing one thing in the ABG, I am telling that, okay, this is due to 
toxic alcohol ingestion. I am telling it is not due to paraquat. That will happen in renal failure also. That will happen in uh, paraquat also. Both, he is not consuming this thing. What one thing specific? Osmolar gap. Osmolar gap is what you need to look in for. You have to check for the osmolar gap. So high anion gap metabolic acidosis with high osmolar gap that you are getting. Then definitely you have to consider whether the problem that is anticipated, it is due to a toxic alcohol ingestion. So toxic alcohol in the sense any of the toxic methanol, it can be isopropyl alcohol or any of these things. You have to suspect that. So what will be the commonest ABG findings in toxic alcohol ingestion? They will start initially developing some amount of hyperventilation. Sort of. They will not have developing metabolic acidosis. They will be more in favor of respiratory alkalosis initially. Then slowly they will go into metabolic. And other thing that is against toxic alcohol ingestion is what? Visual disturbances. The patient is not having any visual disturbances. So there is visual disturbances. There is high osmolar gap metabolic acidosis. High anion gap, high osmolar metabolic acidosis, you have to suspect that. So one thing, here the patient don't have a high osmolar gap. Another thing, there is no visual disturbances. So visual disturbances is there, then you have to think in terms of that also. So that is one thing, metabolic acidosis. But here, it is primarily looking like due to paraquat, which has caused his, he is causing, he have not gone into a type 1 failure. Not going. But there is some carbon dioxide buildup that is happening to him. So, he is going for an impending respiratory failure. So, that is the initial thing. Now, the same patient, uh, you, have, you said the saturation is 96 percentage. Imagine that his oxygen saturation fall down to 94 percentage. What will be your action? We should not start him on OT because it will increase the... So, when you should start him on OT? So, again, our PO2, we can, rather than saying this PO2, we can go with the PO2. PO2, PO2 we are targeting somewhere around 55 to 60 for this patient. 55 to 60, we are accepting it. Mm -hmm. So, somewhere around 80 to 90 saturation falls down only. You need to start down on to. Otherwise, what will happen? The free radical injury will occur fa for much faster and lung damage will occur much more quicker. So, that is the only difference. So, you start giving him oxygen before 90 uh, or 88 percentage, the uh, lung injury will start developing quickly and he will go into pulmonary fibrosis. Now, we have uh, a patient with airway management, I have said, breathing, what do you need to do? Now, what are the treatment options? We have the options for the management of this patient. What are the options? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What are the options available? Okay. Uh, uh, Proven, probably effective, not effective. So, if within 2 hours he is coming, the, we can do the gastro decontamination can be done. With? Uh, activated charcoal. With activated charcoal, okay. Gram per kg, mm. 50 or maximum 50 gram we can give. Okay. And after that, uh, we can uh, start him on uh, steroids. Uh, okay, so steroids, uh, uh, see immunosuppression, you are telling in terms of immunosuppression for pulmonary fibrosis. Pulmonary fibrosis. So, when you need to start, so there are multiple studies in this factor and there are multiple center they have done these studies they have done immunosuppression with high dose methyl prednisolone they have given cyclophosphamide they have given dexona followed by that but there is no definitive consensus that it shows that it decreases the mortality of the patient maybe it will increase the survival but definitely it has not shown any mortality benefit so if you want to start you can start on a high dose polysteroid along with cyclophosphamide Whenever you are suspecting a pulmonary fibrosis, you can straight away start. So, that is maybe or may not. So, uh, that you cannot say it should be done. If you are not doing that also fine. But these are the options that we have. But one thing that I will say definitely needed to be done yeah. for without any delay is the... Charcoal hemoperfusion. It is not just charcoal hemoperfusion. Here you need to... Hemodialysis also. Hemodialysis also. With hemoperfusion. Hemoperfusion. Charcoal hemoperfusion also need to be done. Hemofiltration also will be helpful for this patient. So that is one thing that is definitely we need to do. So just you need to get a charcoal hemoperfusion catheter and you need to attach to the dialysis machine the same technique they have to run through through the charcoal hemoperfusion. So that is one thing that we had found to be effective uh, when we are doing it very early. Charcoal hemoperfusion rather than to see the renal failure developing, rather than seeing the organ dysfunction developing. When we are very sure that it is paraquat, 
rather than waiting for the complication to develop very early one thing what we can be tried is charcoal hemoperfusion along with hemofiltration or hemodialysis depending upon your acid based disorder so acid based disorder is also there definitely you need to do a hemodialysis also so you need to balance the electrolytes you need to correct the acidosis also so that is one thing that is definitely found to be effective in the management of paraquat poisoning and whatever be the management options the best way by which uh, you can save the patient is doing by these things and almost 80 to 90 percentage mortality so that is the worst part of paraquat so whatever you do still there is a higher risk of mortality then what are the other options other option uh, we can uh, antioxidant is also antioxidant what is the uh, antioxidant n acetyl cysteine is one thing that has been because it increases the glutathione reserve so it has been found to be effective maybe you can start for a free radical scavenging sort of an action you can give n acetyl cysteine there is no dosage recommended as like paracetamol maybe you can continue like a 300 mg or 600 mg per hour infusion or maybe tid dosing can be given so n acetyl cysteine then any other agents vitamin e vitamin c vitamin a vitamin c so these are all free radical injury to reduce the free radical injury but again uh, when you see there is no consensus statement stating that this is found to be beneficial for the patient with paracotoxicity then again if there is a systemic uh, if involvement is there then we can also uh, advise the bystander regarding palliative management instead of aggressively managing <laughs> <laughs> see here this fellow he had some alcohol and he went and accidentally drank uh, and uh, paraquet. We know that it is going to be a high mortality, right. but imagine that uh, this situation, whether holds good, which situation is an end stage uh, malignancy disease, he wanted to die, he went and then we can discuss. But otherwise, there is still some 10 percentage of uh, survival whenever you are doing all those things. Then there is another molecule you said regarding antioxidant. Uh, I don't know whether Edaravon, Edaravon, E D A R A V O N E. Uh, so that is one free radical agent. There was one I don't remember exactly. Uh, maybe three four years back there was one article that has been published. It's a free radical scavenging agent. They are found to be beneficial in paraquat poisoning. Uh, but again, as as I said, there is no consensus statement whether it can be given. It needed to be given. Uh, because we don't, uh, s there are institutions they are saying that you go ahead with cyclophosphamide, you go with uh, methylprednisolone or dexamethasone and you give pulse steroid therapy and uh, you can survive them, make them survive. But best, even the best possible centers they are saying it is 20 percentage is the best survival rate that they are claiming to be. What our experience, we had uh, uh, like two, three patients uh, survived following paraquet. All these cases, what was the advantage that the quantity of consumption was less than 20 milligram. It was one was less than 20 milligram and uh, other one was uh, we did charcoal hemoperfusion very early for all this group of patients. So that is the uh, three survival stories that what we are having from paraquet. But in general it all depends upon the amount of consumption and also it matters how the underlying conditions are. Already imagine that already a CKD patient on top of that he is drinking uh, paraquet then definitely the mortality rate is going to be pretty bad already don't so when ILD or already there is a pulmonary fibrosis developed and on top of they are taking this then it is going to be a higher risk so uh, the possibilities that they can have depends upon the amount of ingestion that they have done and once they come to the ER the three critical things what I said is regarding one is regarding your gastric lavage so that holds good like for any other uh, poisons, poison victim coming to the ear and other thing it, it can cause burns to the skin also. So that decontamination also needed to be taken care of and this airway compromise can be one big challenge. So when you are planning to intubate there is a large time. So that time maybe a surgical airway options also you need to think in your mind maybe a bronchoscopy or a guided intubation also might be required. Video laryngoscope guided intubation maybe because this can cause all the airway burns also. And the next uh, uh, most challenging will be the oxygen one. So the routine practice is to start oxygen when it falls down less than 95 percentage. Imagine that you are treating like a COPD victim for this group of patients. 88 to 90 we are accepting it. Less than that you start on oxygen and uh, maybe PO2 of 55 to 60 target that you need to remember. Then early uh, charcoal hemoperfusion maybe with hemofiltration with hemodialysis that is the other option that is available. Cyclophosphamide with methyl prednisolone with uh, Dexona, high uh, doses of Dexamethasone also can be tried uh, and uh, free radical whatever agent, Encestral Sustain and Adarone, these are all the drugs but Adarone we don't have any experience. I don't think it is available in India right now, there is some uh, Chinese study that's what I remember exactly. So uh, these are the things. So what happened to him? 
uh, patient uh, at uh, like uh, next day patient had uh, like developing he developed pooling of secretions in mouth the difficulty in speaking and swallowing water so we gave a intake consultation and uh, flex, uh, flexible laryngoscopy was done and there was thick secretions uh, unhealthy epiglottis with adequate glottic space and mobile vocal cords uh, around 11 p uh, he had developed breathlessness four hours later and had tachycardia with restlessness and all and abg repeat showed a type 1 respiratory failure uh, and uh, poor we uh, the bystanders they gave dni and uh, at around half an hour later he was not for intubation he was decided uh, not to not be intubated, intubated depending upon the disease progression progression and after half an hour he went into bradycardia with uh, saturation of 40 percentage deteriorated and uh, was could not okay be okay so uh, Whenever you get an unknown injection liquid, this is a big challenge in the ED. Unknown injection liquid injections coming to the ED and uh, they suddenly deteriorate in front of us. So, uh, what are the common liquid injections that, that can come to the ED? Can you just one, two, three, four, five? You can just say. Uh, what are the common uh, ingredients that they can come up with? Poisoning. Organophosphorus. So, the classical triad, all those things yeah. we can look into. Then? Then uh, opioids. I am asking about liquid injections. Liquid injections. What are the whenever the patient is coming that I have consumed some liquid? So what all things you should uh, be? Petroleum. Petroleum distillates. Okay, then acids, toxic acids. So uh, then. Listen, I can give you a uh, scenario. Uh, this is not very common in India. I just wanted you to think over this and you have to tell me what is the injection that the patient had. The patient has come again with an unknown injection, clear liquid. Uh, he's, uh, uh, maybe you can think is that he is in UK. Uh, that is the area you can remember. And because it is pretty cold there right now. And he has taken some uh, liquid and uh, you have uh, taken to the, him to the emergency room and once you start measuring the BP, he is developing tetany. QTC is prolonged. So again, you are dealing with hypocalcemia. So which liquid, I said he is in UK, cold temperature. So what you will use? Antifreeze. So what is the antifreeze containing of? Ethylene glycol. So uh, produce this hypocalcemia. So uh, hypocalcemia, these things you need to remember. The antifreeze. So that can produce with, uh, they can come with uh, hypocalcemia uh, to the ED. So, so liquid, total they are coming up, it, you need to look in for other manifestation. Just the burns and all can be just an acid ingestion or any of this petroleum distillate. You can maybe able to get it from the smell. But uh, other one like paraquet, renal failure and uh, lung injury. Then the next one, uh, the most common is organophosphorus. That's what, what we said. Then most problem, what they what what is the thing that you need to prevent this? You should not keep these things in the area where we commonly drink. The, what will the common mistake that they do? They do keep it in the bottles where it is routinely kept to drink water or something. They would have taken some emptied Pepsi bottle or Coke bottle and they would have filled up this and there will not be any color difference. They will be just taking. So these are the, since this is an accidental ingestion, so that is one thing, preventive aspect, especially in children. So accidentally they can just go into the uh, area and they can just drink. So especially kerosene, well, that is the reason why the kerosene has been given the color. You see the kerosene has been given the color, it is to understand to differentiate that nobody goes and drinks that. And that smell has also been given to that because that nobody will go and drink kerosene. So to prevent all those things. Okay. And anything else that you need to add on? See, uh, CNS involvement won't be there with paracetamol. You know, it doesn't cause a blood brain barrier. So that also we can look to differentiate. Yeah, CNS again, CNS if it is involvement is there, you have to think of other, other options. options. Yeah. Okay. okay.